What's going on everyone? Welcome back. Patrick here and moving on to another example dealing with the intermediate value theorem. I'm going to follow the exact same process that I did in the previous example. So make sure you watch those before you watch this one. And notice that this example here it's a little bit different than the previous three. In the previous three examples, we were given the actual equations to work with. But in this case, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to read this and create an equation from these words. So you may run into questions like that sometimes as well. Sometimes you'll, the equations will be given. Sometimes you got to create them. And so this is an example where we got to create the equation first. And then once we have the equation, follow the exact same process that we did before. So show that there exists a number where when you subtract its cubed root from its square, the difference is four. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is this number that we're talking about, I'm gonna let that equal x. I'm gonna let x equal the number. And so let's read this really carefully. Show there exists a number where when you subtract its cubed root, so the cubed root of this number is gonna be the third root of x. When you subtract its cubed root from its square, now notice this doesn't say square root, it says square. So that means that number squared. When you subtract its cubed root from its square, the difference is four, right? So if I subtract this third cube from the square, so we'll have x squared minus the third root of x, that difference is equal to four. And that is the equation for this description right here. So when you're given a description like this, make sure you read it really carefully. Uh, notice we're subtracting the cube root from the square. So make sure you don't write the third root of x minus its square. Right? It didn't say that. It said we're subtracting this from that. So this has to be there, not the other way around. So just make sure you're reading these descriptions really carefully. But the same kind of process is going to apply. You got to let x be that number that they're talking about. And then from there, make a certain equation. And so now this question becomes, we have to show that this equation has at least one real root. That's exactly what they're asking, like the previous three examples that we did. So show there exists a number with that description. Exact same thing, showing that this equation has a root, has at least one real root. So we're gonna follow the exact same process. So what you wanna do, like we did before, bring everything over to one side. So I'm gonna bring this four over to the left side. So we'll have x squared minus third root of x minus four equals zero. And then you wanna let that expression on the left side be a function that we'll define. So we'll let f of x equal x squared minus the third root of x minus four. And we have to show that there's some kind of x value that's gonna make this function equal to zero. We have to show that this function is gonna have at least one x-intercept, right? And if we show that, then we show that there exists a number with the description that we were given. We show that there's an x value that satisfies this equation that makes the left side equal to the right side. So, uh, first thing I actually want to talk about is the domain and continuity of this function. Because remember, when we're going to use this theorem, we got to make sure that the interval we pick with, uh, the interval that we pick, f of x is going to be continuous on that interval. And notice that this function here is continuous for all x values for xer. Because notice that there's no restriction here. This is x squared. x squared, if you look at that function by itself, the domain is xcr. And then notice there's no restriction here, the third root of x. Because we could take the third root, we could take an odd root of a negative number 
So x can be negative here, x could be zero, x could be positive, right? The third root of x, the way that that function looks like, it's kind of like uh, something like that, right? Could be any x value. Now, if this was the square root or some kind of even root, so like let's say there was a four here or a six or an eight or just the square root, which would be like an imaginary two there, then there would be a restriction. Then x cannot be negative. The domain of this would be x has to be greater than or equal to zero because you can't take the even root of, an, um, of a negative number. But you can take the odd root of a negative number. So this could be three, this could be, um, this could be five, this could be seven, doesn't matter. Then the uh, domain for the function is uh, xer. And so, this function is continuous for all x values, which is nice. We don't have to worry about picking this interval within that domain. The domain is just xcr, so we have more freedom, quote unquote, to uh, pick whatever interval that we want. And if you remember the interval that we want to pick, we want to pick two x values that are going to have a positive and negative y value respectively. Because if we do that and it's continuous on that interval, it's got to cross the x-axis at some point. At some point, the function is going to equal zero. It's going to have a y value of zero. So let's do some uh, trial and error here. Let's pick some x value. So usually first x value, if I can, if that x value is zero is within the domain of the function, I usually pick zero to start with. Notice that if we plug in zero for all the x values, this would be zero. Third root is zero, zero. So we'll have zero minus four, negative four. So um, this function here, it has a point zero and negative four. And now what we want to do is we want to pick another x value that's going to give us a positive y value. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick x values that uh, that aren't decimals, so where this third root is going to be smooth. So notice that we could pick one. So uh, let's try one. What would happen there? One squared is just one. Third root of one is just one. So we'll have one minus one, which is zero. Minus four would give us a y value of negative four. So notice an x value of one, it actually has the same y value as an x value zero. They both have that y value of negative four. But that's not going to really work for us because we want to get a y value that's positive. So it, we're going to cross that x-axis. That's what we're trying to show. So one won't work. Uh, what would be another x value where this third root is going to be smooth? Uh, eight. So what if we pick eight? Well, eight is definitely going to give us a positive y value because notice eight squared is 64, which is a pretty big number. And then the third root of eight is uh, two. That's why I picked eight. So this is going to be smooth. It's not going to be a decimal. So if we plug in eight for all the x values, we'll have 64 minus two, which is the third root of eight, which would give us 62. And then 62 minus four would give us 58. A positive y value, which is what we want. So we know at an x value of 8, this function is going to have a y value of 58. Uh, let me just double check the algebra here. Yeah, it's all good. 8 and 58. So because this function is continuous for all x values, as we stated before, it's going to be continuous for this interval. And so, because it's going to be continuous, at some point it has to cross this x-axis. At some point, this function is going to equal zero. It's going to have a y value of zero. It may even cross multiple times. I actually don't really know how this function is going to look, but that doesn't really matter. That's not what we're trying to show. We're not trying to graph it. We're just trying to show that there's going to be some kind of value that makes the function equal to zero. And so what we want to do now is kind of state it with the intermediate value theorem. So I'm going to take all these parameters, 
and then uh, sub them in here. So given f of x, this function here that we define, is continuous on the interval between 0 and 8. That's the interval that we picked. So the a value is 0, the b value is 8. And f of 0 does not equal f of 8, which it doesn't. f of 0 is negative 4. That doesn't equal 58. If n is between f of a and f of b, so the n value we're working with is 0. We're trying to show that this function is going to equal 0 at some point. It's going to have a y value of 0. So if 0 is in between f of 0 and f of 8, which it is, right? 0 is in between negative 4 and 58. Then there exists a number c between, on this interval, 0 and 8. where f of c is going to equal 0. So at some point between 0 and 8, there's going to be some, an x value that's going to have a y value 0. That's going to make the function equal to 0. So there's going to be some kind of x value, some kind of x intercept between 0 and 8. There may even be, as I mentioned, multiple x intercept, but there's definitely going to be at least one. And so we're done because because we showed this, then we showed that that original equation that we had, x squared minus the third root of x equals 4, we showed that there's going to be some kind of x value between 0 and 8 that's going to make that left side equal to that right side, which, coming back to this description, we showed that there exists a number. The number is going to be between 0 and 8, where when you subtract its cubed root from its square, the difference is going to be 4.